that are gathered here. So Pastor Tony from Standish, a dear brother in the Lord, and uh, bring it. Hey guys, it's good to see you. Had a an interesting year this year. Uh, got a call April fifteenth, not April, but March. And my dad had uh, slipped and fallen, and. Uh, Hit his head pretty good on the island. He was he's, he was 89 years old, and he had a good run. He was uh, unbelievably physically fit, still turned wrenches and heavy equipment, still went to Bible study, volunteered in the church thrift store, did a lot of stuff. Uh, drove, no impairments, no problems. He's still a strong man. Hornery. He was acting funny the next day, and Mom called me and said, I'm taking him into ER. Something's wrong. They thought he had a brain bleed. What they found was a little more distressing. He had a glioma, the same cancer that took John McCain, and uh, turned out not to be treatable. And we buried Dad. He passed away on tax day, April 15th. He was able to communicate up until the day before he died. He was still laughing at his little brother's lame jokes. And uh, the thing that was overwhelmingly permeating our family atmosphere those last three weeks especially of his life, he kept expressing how grateful to God he was for the life he'd had, for his salvation, for his family. God calls himself our Heavenly Father. And this isn't about me, it just, it's been in my mind, and that's why I share this. We sometimes struggle, because not all of us have had the relationship with our earthly fathers that we would have liked to have had. And sometimes when the grave is covered, it hits you that, at least for this life, this is as far as it goes. Sometimes you mourn the loss of the one who was, and sometimes you mourn the loss of what could have been that wasn't. I look around here, I see a lot of dads. I'm, I'm a grandfather, I have nine grandkids, three kids. Um, God calls himself our Heavenly Father, and in my life as a believer, and in my life as a pastor, I run into countless men who really struggle with the fatherhood of God because they struggle with the fatherhood of their father. Now, I don't know if I'm hitting any nerves and I'm not trying to. Well, maybe I am. Maybe I'm aiming at me because usually when I preach, it's for an audience of one. But if there's anybody I'm aiming at, it's usually myself. But we're going to talk a little bit about the God that we serve and his commitment towards us. Now, I love that first song in the, in the set that Jose led us in. Talking about grace. His grace is enough, except when it isn't. Now, it's all sufficient. It's always enough. But sometimes we're a little bit of a hard sell believing that. We give lip service to it, but it's not always something that we, we take home and draw on. I'd like to pray right now, and then we're going to get into the Word. We're going to go to Romans chapter 5. Father... In the name of Jesus, <laughs> and, and Father, I ask for your superintendence on us as, give me a mouth to speak, give me clarity in my thoughts, give me a, an obedient heart, give us ears to hear your spirit as you speak through the sword of your spirit, the word of God, in Jesus' name, amen. I look forward to this every year. I, I get fed. I mean, in past years, I've heard from Brother Mike and from Terry and from Dave Sweet and from Ron Hall and, you know, all these guys, Marty. And, you know, it's, this has been a treat for me. Um, 
I just wanted to go to camp the first year I ever came. I didn't plan on teaching, and I get a phone call from Scanlon saying, dude, I'm in the hospital. <laughs> I need to take my session. So it's kind of a baptism of fire. And you all didn't kill me, so I'm, I'm back for more. I'd like you to go to Romans 5, and it says, just we're going to look at the first 11 verses, and I'm reading from the NIV, so if it's not the same as your translation, uh, bear with me. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, he says, therefore, that means you have to go back a bit. In chapter 3, Paul makes the case that Jew and Gentile alike are under the condemnation of sin. There is none righteous, no, not one. And, and he goes on through there. But in chapter 3, verse 21, he says, but now a righteousness from God has been made known. It's from God. It's alien to ourselves. We can't develop this. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. It's from God. It's by faith from first to last. And he talks about what God has done for us in Christ. You go through chapter 4 and he gives the example of Abraham. Same thing you see in Galatians chapter 3. He talks about the fact that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him, imputed to him, reckoned to him as righteousness. Now this is an important point. He's writing to people. At the time this was written, Nero is newly on the throne. Claudius, the previous emperor, had evicted all the Jews from Rome. They're just starting to filter back. It seems that it was largely a Gentile church. And the Romans and the Greeks were polytheists before they were saved. They worshipped Jupiter. They worshipped all these different divinities, gods. And when everything went wrong, they thought that somehow they had offended the powers that be in the universe. Somehow they had to placate this god or this goddess that everything that came down on them, they, they had to go find out what was it I have done. To understand how revolutionary this teaching was, you have to think about that. And Paul makes a statement that for them would have been almost startling. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, justification is that God has declared us righteous. I don't stand before God as if I never sinned. I stand before God as a guilty, condemned sinner whose debt has been totally discharged by the Son of God and has given me his righteousness. Amen? Man. And he says, since we've been justified through faith, God has justified us, and we need peace. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, his suffering servant, the iniquity of us all. I think of my heavenly father, and I think of my earthly father, and the thing that is being driven home in this passage is that we have peace with God. Sometimes we struggle with the concept of God as our father. I mean, I had a great father. If I did wrong, he was my worst nightmare. You know, he caught me smarting off to my mom one time using some rather ungodly language when I was 15. I didn't know he'd come home from work early. Dad was golden gloves, right? That was a big mistake. And he laid me up against the wall and talked to me very softly and gently and explained that it wasn't proper to address 
the mother of his children and that, those verbiage and that tone of voice, and that if I ever did it again, his fist would be closed the next time. Now get up and come on, let's go get a cup of, cup of water and sit down and talk. Um, very calm, very rational. He held me accountable. He also had my back. He also was one of my greatest cheerleaders. And we, and we also were so much alike that we butted heads constantly when I was in high school. And uh, I love my dad. And there was always some tension there. But I knew that he was there for me. I have dealt with a lot of people, and they view God as a vengeful God, just waiting for them to step out of line and cream them. Now, don't get me wrong. God is holy, and he wants us to be holy as he is holy. But he's not at war with us. Our fathers, it says in Hebrews, disciplined us as they saw fit, and, and sometimes they made mistakes. You ever gotten corrected by your dad when it was actually your sister that did it? You know? And you're sitting there taking one for the team because you don't want both of us to get whacked. Maybe you did, you know? And he made a mistake. My wife had to pull me aside more than once and say, you know what, you didn't see everything that happened there. Let me tell you what actually happened right before you walked in the room. And I've had to go back to one of my kids and say, listen, Rachel, Dad's sorry. I, I, I should have listened. You tried to tell me. I punished you, and I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Because sometimes dads do what they think is right in their own eyes, but we don't know everything that God knows. But God always does things not just what, for what is we would consider right, but always for our good and for our benefit. Even in his justice, when he corrects his children, he's acting in love. But he's not at war with us. Therefore, since God has justified us through Christ, we have peace with God. The gods aren't at war with us. He's telling the Romans, listen, when you go through trials, when you go through hardship, when you go through difficulty, when you suffer reverses, when the world just doesn't make sense to you and nothing's going right, you need to understand something. God is not your adversary. God loves you and he will discipline you. He will give you trials to help you grow, but you can trust his wounds. Oscar Wilde, a rather depraved man, it, it is thought by some people that he repented before he died. He was a, a total libertine, but he once said, and I thought his definition was actually pretty accurate, that the definition of a friend is somebody who stabs you from the front. Well, think about it. Precious to me are the people that have loved me enough to get me in a corner and tell me exactly what they thought because they cared about me. I don't like it necessarily at the time, but they didn't talk behind my back. They came right to me and unloaded. That's a kindness. Here's God. Trials come. It can be discipline. Those he loves, he disciplines. And if there is no discipline, he said, you may not be legitimate. You may not be actually mine. If you are his child, he's going to correct you at times. Aren't you glad? The Word of God, you know, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, biblical truth, for reproof. You're flying an airplane. You got flight following, maybe from Fallon Tower, and you're out over the middle of nowhere, Nevada, and they tell you, hey, you know, give your call numbers and tell you you're about four degrees off course and you're going to run out of fuel and crash, and and they just leave it there. Well, you got rebuked, but you didn't get corrected. You need both, rebuking and correcting. You need to know how to get back on course. God does that for us. God is merciful. He is faithful. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. People have always and only been saved by grace through faith. Amen? Abraham believed. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting that by his death and resurrection, he has reconciled us to the Father, that he is Lord, and that we are to follow him. Man. And we have access by faith into this grace. And you all know the definition of grace. We could all give several similar definitions, but it's unmerited or unearned kindness or favor. God doing for us that which we could not do for ourselves ever. It's akin to mercy, which is God not doing to us what we so richly deserve. 
I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I love mercy. <laughs> and I'm grateful to God for his mercy. But we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That word hope, elpis in the Greek, uh, it's, uh, it means confidence. A settled conviction, a confident expectation. Most of us, we hope. I had a refund coming, I had a check coming, and I was hoping my check came in the mail all week and it finally came today. Something I wanted but I wasn't sure was going to happen. It's a, it's, this is different than that kind of hope. This is a settled conviction. We rejoice in the confidence of the glory of God. A lot of you know Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. And we're to live with that reality. This, hold things loosely here, God says. This is a temporary place. Um, we rejoice in the confidence of the glory of God. We know that we have an eternal home. My sister and I took turns reading scripture to my dad, praying with him. I went over the gospel several times just to make sure. I mean, he, he professed to have trusted Christ as Savior, but I just, it can't hurt to go over this one more time, right? And it's... Uh, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. He was looking forward to seeing my sister again, who passed away in 1980. And not only so, and this is the part we don't like so much, there are people out there that would teach you that if you're a, a child of God, you're just going to go from glory to glory, from victory to victory. Um, the world's your oyster. Um, God says, you know what? We rejoice in our sufferings. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really care for suffering a whole lot. Not my favorite thing, right? Probably not yours. But the reality of this life is, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. Flipsis from the Greek, if any of you are familiar with it. It's pain, it's hardship, it's sorrow, it's affliction. But be of good cheer. Why? I've overcome it. Amen? And with him we overcome it. But he says rejoice in your sufferings. He just told these people when everything goes wrong, number one, God is not your enemy. Now, he's a loving father, and he's going he's gonna to regulate when it's time. I don't know about you, but I am grateful to God that my father cared enough to discipline me, give me advice, give me correction, lovingly give me direction, because he cared about what kind of person I was going to be 10 years hence, 20 years hence, 30 years hence, 40 years hence. It mattered to him. Your heavenly father loves you. He's not at war with you. You may be at war with him, but he's not at war with you. But he disciplines those he loves. He wants holiness in our lives. And he cares about what's going to happen. How many of you dads, uh, we don't need hands or anything else, but how many of you dads know the agony of seeing your growing adult children, your daughters, your sons, stepping out into the world and making decisions that kill you? You want better things for them than what they are settling for. Your father wants better things for me and for you than what we settle for. And that's why he allows a lot of the things that happen to happen. Every good and perfect gift, don't be fooled. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the father of lights with whom there is no variableness or even a shadow of changing, it says in James. He can be trusted, but that also means his wounds can be trusted. When he has disciplined us, it's not in vengeance, it's in mercy, it's in compassion. It's with an eye towards what should be as opposed to what is. And he tells these people, because they were, in their previous life, before they were saved, they were wont to find out what they'd done to anger the gods before they were Christians. And he's telling them, you've got to make sure you don't view God that way. Now, there's two types of love in this world. And forgive me, because Fred and Greg and... You know, Joe, have heard this before from me, but there's contingent love and there's unconditional love, or agape. It's a commitment expressed by what we do. Contingent love is this. I will show approval to you. I will accept you. I will commend you. I will like you if you play ball my way. Okay, that's self-love. It's not anything else but that. And there's a lot of people for whom we find out the hard way that approval, that acceptance, that commendation comes with a price tag. I will tell you that there is nothing you can do that will make God love you more than he does right now. And there's nothing you can do that will make him love you less. 
He loves you because you are made in his image and he chooses to love you. It's not based on your performance. And it's hard because sometimes in dealing with our earthly fathers, we have always felt, and I've dealt with so many men that said, you know, there was a guy, I'm going to call him Larry. That was not his name. Just in the odd chance that somebody knew him. But I buried his dad 30 years ago. He was part of our congregation. He was a, a loving man, a kind man, a good man. And he would... Okay. Oh, wow. Woo! He's got it going on, man. Anyway, but... He, his dad would talk to me about Larry. His dad would tell me how proud he was of his son. His dad would tell me about his achievements. And after the funeral, and I sat down and I was talking to Larry, I shared that with him, and his eyes teared up, and he said, you know, in all my life, I never heard that from my father. And he had a hard time, even with his faith, because... Thinking of God as his father was a stumbling block because the father he had, he felt he could never do enough to please. Do you today understand that nothing you can do will make him love you more than he loves you now or less? Do you understand that we serve him as Christians because he has accepted us, not in the hopes that he will? It's a whole different motivation. We either understand grace or we don't. And if we don't, you need to seek him today. Paul is talking to these people, and their whole religious upbringing had been performance-oriented. They had to please the gods, placate the gods, satisfy their wrath, somehow buy them off, beg, do whatever it took. The generals going into battle were stopped. At times, they were frustrated because some of them were quite outspoken unbelievers that the priests had to take the entrails and read the omens and look at the sheep's liver to decide whether they went right or left or attacked or retreated. Paul is telling him here, listen, it's a whole new ball game, guys. Your heavenly father loves you. Your heavenly father is merciful. Your heavenly father is holy and he will hold you accountable, but he will hold you accountable in love. And you have access through Christ into his grace. It can't be earned. It can't be deserved. He is not angry with us. We have peace. We rejoice in the confidence of the glory of God. His grace is enough. Is it? Think about it. Think about the words we sing sometimes. I wonder sometimes because we, it's a catchy tune and we like it. I love that song. And I think, God, yes, it's enough. I am a poor, lost sinner who has found redemption in the person of Jesus Christ. Through his death or resurrection, you have reconciled me to yourself, and I am clean, I am free, I am holy and righteous and just, a joint heir with Christ, not because of anything I have done, it says in Titus, but because of God's mercy. Amen? And that's what he's trying to drive home to them. And then he goes further and says, listen, our sufferings produce things. He talks about the things they produce. We can rejoice in our sufferings. There's three things that happen when we go through trials. We go through hardship. Number one, I'm off the rails. And God in love is correcting me, admonishing me, rebuking me, and showing me the right way to go. Or maybe I'm not out of his will. Maybe I am seeking him sincerely for my heart and it's for my growth. You know, there's another one. It's the one I don't like at all, but it's just as valid. Sometimes there are people watching you and me who need to see a believer clinging to God in the midst of the storm. It's not for our benefit, it's for theirs. And we think, God, I don't see any good reason why this is happening. And God says, you won't. You know, Job never got an answer. He said, why? Why? What he got was a greater vision of God. Sometimes you get the answer. Some of you and I, we come out of the other end of a trial with 20-20 hindsight, and we think, God, I see your fingerprints all over this. And sometimes you have to wait until we stand before him. Now we see through a glass, but darkly. Then we shall see face to face. There'll be clarity someday. He doesn't guarantee it right now. 
And I'm like Job. Sometimes I, th I want to call God. I want God on the dock. I want God to stand up and answer questions. I want him to tell me why he allows things or doesn't allow things or causes things or doesn't cause things to happen the way they do. God says, are you done? <laughs> are you going to trust me? Do you understand that the wounds I give you can be trusted? It's because of my mercy. It's because of my compassion. It's because of my grace. And it's because I've begun a work in you that I will carry it out to completion, yea, even unto the day of Christ Jesus, that I'm allowing this. Sufferings are not the result of his anger. We can rejoice in them because they produce perseverance. Perseverance is the salmon going upstream against a strong current. Perseverance is that football player pushing that sled with all that weight and building endurance. We can comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have received in Christ, can't we? 2 Corinthians chapter 1. But that doesn't come without seeking God in all things. My prayer for myself and for you is that we would, like Paul, be able to say, I want to know him. Epignosis, I want to know him. I don't want to know about him. I want to know him in all things, in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I want to be conformable to him and his death. I want to be totally abandoned to the will of the Father. And thereby, really the sense of the Greek there, attaining the resurrection of the dead. I, I, when Jesus said, blessed are the meek, it's a meekness towards God. It is that attitude that says, God, not my will, but thine be done. It's the attitude of Christ in the garden the night he was betrayed. For they shall inherit the earth. God has a heaven and an earth prepared for us, doesn't he? The home of righteousness. We got, we're going to have everything Adam threw away without the possibility of losing it. In our sufferings, they produce perseverance. We keep on keeping on. You know, Nietzsche was famous for a statement, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. Um, maybe and maybe not. <laughs> Rolls off the tongue real easy, but I would say that which does not kill me if I will lean on my savior will make me stronger but not in my own strength. We're a lot like Gideon. Sometimes we have it all planned out. Guys are great at planning. We got dreams, we got plans, we got goals. And we figure it all out, and God takes you to the water hole and says, there's still too many, man. I got to sift you. <laughs> I'm going to cut you down a bit because I want, the, I want you to understand that this is my doing in your life, not yours. I want you to understand that I can be trusted. I want you to understand that apart from me, you can do nothing. It produces perseverance. It produces character. You know, what's character? Well, I think a lot of debate on that, but I would say it's the fruit of the Spirit manifest in your life. Two different passages kind of give you, I think, incomplete lists of it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Second Peter 1, it talks about faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. As we seek God in the face of resistance, we grow. If you're never challenged, if you never have opposition, if there's never hardships, if it's always easy, pity you. Because someday when the roof falls in, there's no strength. God says, as you seek me in the midst of adversity, I've got you and you're going to grow you're going to have perseverance. You're going to develop character. You're going to have hope. Again, that word means confidence, a settled conviction, an assurance of who you are and to whose you are. And it doesn't disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the spirit whom he has given us. I see some gray hairs out here. At least you have hair, right? I'm, I'm rapidly losing mine. Dave's, it's too late for you, Dave. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why I grew the mustache. That's why I got this thing. I can't, can't, can't grow out of my head, so it's coming down here. But you know what? As I get older and I become more limited, when I was a young man, especially in ministry, I could always put my head down, apply more effort, and by sheer force of will, make something happen. You know what God calls that? He calls it wood. He calls it hay. He calls it straw. 
as we get older and more limited or as we have to trust God in trials, something happens. We're forced to cast ourselves on his strength, on his wisdom, depend on his power. And man, he starts moving mountains. It's a good thing. That confidence doesn't disappoint. God's poured out his love in our hearts and we realize, God, it's only by your grace that I stand. It's only by your grace that you are making yourself known through me. And we can each say that if we're leaning on him. And it's comforting to know that we bring nothing to the table. At least it is for me because that, that love isn't contingent. He loves us because he chooses to. That's his nature. He does it because he wants to. <laughs> And he goes a little further and he says, since, in verse 9, well, let's go a little further. He says in verse 6, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. I remember working in an auto parts store and I was, I was new. I was a counterman there. I was going to Bible college. And uh, someone, someone would call the store and say, hey, who's this? Oh, this is LeBay. He goes, let me talk to somebody else. Well, I was a salesman. I couldn't do him any good. I didn't write the checks. He wanted to talk to somebody who could do him some good. Jesus didn't look for us and say, hey, you got something to offer me. He loved us unconditionally. When we were powerless, he died for the ungodly. That would be me. That would be you. We didn't bring anything to the table but ourselves. And, and I, nothing to commend me. I, was, I, I fall short of the glory of God. I commit sin, transgression. I'm iniquitous. That is simply that I want to make the rules for me, not God. I, I, I don't want God to tell me how to live. I want to live any way I want. That's what iniquity means. Lawlessness, anomios in the Greek. And he said, you know, when I was in that condition, Christ died for me. Very rarely would anybody die for a righteous man, though for a good man somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated. He proved it. He demonstrated his own love for us in this, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. People call me at the auto parts store. I couldn't do anything for them. They didn't want to talk to me. They want to talk to the guy that wrote the checks. Jesus reached out to the humble, to the beggars, to the prostitutes, to the drunks, to, the, to everybody, the, the self-righteous who thought they had it made, to the respectable folks, to all of them. None of them brought anything to the table except their sin and their need. There's an equality of need at the foot of the cross. Christ died for the ungodly. Some people get offended by that, but that applies to every single one of us. And he said, you know, seeing as how or since we have now been justified, declared righteous by his blood, how much more will we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, I like the way Colossians says that it, it says that we were enemies in our minds. Anybody like me have a stubborn mind that doesn't like to change the channel? You know? And you're praying, God, I really want to see this taken captive to Christ because I don't like the direction I'm going. Maybe it's bitterness, maybe it's lust, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, and I'm struggling with something. We wrestle, don't we? The, the, the sinful mind is hostile to God. And uh, even as a believer saved by grace, there's this battle going on between my old nature and the Spirit. But we've been saved by His blood. We've been saved. It's kind of a comparative degree. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? You know, at the judgment... The presence of God from which earth and heaven flee away. The presence of God that Moses could not look on without dying, without perishing. God had to hide him in a cleft as he passed. He's going to draw us joyfully into his orbit. And rather than being consumed, we are going to thrive in his presence because he has suited us for fellowship with him for eternity. Because of what he's done for us through the Spirit, by grace, through faith in Christ. That's a pretty neat thing. We're saved from wrath. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, 
How much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? There's an interesting contrast during the trial of Jesus before the priests. Annas, Caiaphas, the father-in-law and the son-in-law. High priest emeritus and the current high priest. And they've got him on the carpet. They've arrested him. They want him to beg for his life. They want him to kowtow to them. They want him to acknowledge their authority or they want him dead. And the witnesses that they've suborned, hired, bribed, they can't get their story straight. And they're starting to look really foolish. So the high priest finally says, how long will you keep us in suspense? Tell us or tell, or, or tell us, are you or are you not the Christ? I adjure you, it says, I adjure you by the living God, tell us plainly. And he replies in the words of Daniel 7, where the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven will be worshipped by every nation, tribe, kingdom, and language. He's coming in judgment to regulate this earth. And he says, I tell you the truth, you're going to see me coming on the clouds. One presumes to judge, the other says, I am the judge. <laughs> and we'll see in the end whose word will stand. We have Caiaphas's ossuary, his bone box. My Lord has an empty tomb. And as he has died for us, he has saved us through his life. Guys, I don't know what kind of relationship you've had with your earthly father. But your heavenly father loves you. Your heavenly father sent his only begotten son who came willingly to take your place in judgment. Your heavenly father has paid every debt that could possibly be needed to reconcile you to himself. There's nothing you can do. Jesus, when his work was done, he sat down at the right hand of the father. His work is finished. And yet sometimes we don't think we've suffered enough. We don't quit beating ourselves. We don't quit feeling like somehow if I were just a better guy, God would love me more. I can tell you on the authority of God's word, he cannot love you less or more than he does right now. And his wounds can be trusted. He who went to the cross for you isn't going to abandon you now. <laughs> Amen? And we need to seek him. Where does that leave us, you know? You go through hard times. You go through trials. <laughs> People turn against you. Things blow up in your face. You get a bad diagnosis and you wonder what's wrong. My daughter, the first day she had her license, she was driving my car and she happened to T-bone somebody in a parking lot. And she'd saved money for her new car. And she talked to the lady, waited till she came out, showed her the dent, told her what happened, and it took almost every penny of her car savings. She wanted to go to college at the end of that year to repair that lady's car. And as we drove home, she says, Dad, I think God hates me. And I thought, you know, I don't think God made you do what you did. <laughs> Honey, accidents happen. Learn from it. But it, just because something goes wrong, just because things don't go our way, doesn't mean the Almighty has it in for us. It's quite the opposite. So how do you handle these things? And how do you view him as your father? Do you understand that he's not at war with you? Do you understand that we have peace with him through our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you understand that when he wounds us, it can be trusted and we can seek him in this, knowing that he will glorify himself and work to change us as we seek him in the process? And I'll tell you, when I go through trials, I don't know what you do. I, I'm the first guy to say, God, please make it go away. Just make it stop, please. If it doesn't, it finally, usually it takes a while for the nickel to drop for this guy. Then it is, okay, if you're not going to take it away, then how can I grow through this? What do you want me to do through this? How can you be glorified in this if you're not going to remove this thing from me? I would encourage you, always ask him to take it away. It's never wrong to ask, <laughs> right? But if he doesn't, understand he's not your enemy. Understand what he does can be trusted, even if you don't understand it. Understand that we need to seek him in all things. I want to be like Paul. 
You know, I quoted it earlier out of Philippians 3. It's just like getting married. I wanted to know Cindy Louise Wetmore in all things as her husband, as her friend, as her partner. I wanted to go through life with her. We shared, a, we shared a bed. We've shared checking accounts. We've shared the parenting of children. We've shared good times and hardships. And there's plenty of both in life, isn't there? And I want to know Jesus the same way. Not the good parts version. I want to know all of it. I want to know him in all things. In all things give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It rolls off the tongue easy until you're dealing with all things, right? <laughs> But guys, the choice we have, will we trust him? Will we seek him? Will we want to know him in all things? He's not your enemy. He's the best friend you've ever had. And Paul finishes this the way he starts it. We also rejoice in what? In our hardships, in our troubles, in our sorrows, in our difficulties, in our shortcomings. He's there. He's working. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. All right, Wilson's here. He's got a cold hamburger waiting. I'll tell you something. One of my favorite verses is Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where Paul says, Being confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you will carry it out to completion, yea, even under the day of Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Rachel had a hard time that day because all her car savings went to fixing a car she just smacked. And yet God was in that too. What are you dealing with today? Do you understand that your loving Father allows things at times for your benefit to correct you, to divert you from a dangerous path, to help you grow, to train you, to help you to be an encouragement to someone else? who needs to see a godly person seeking God through a storm. <laughs> I know people that have come to Christ through the witness of others who have gone through hardships. God is at work. He can be trusted. You don't have to try to earn his approval. We don't serve him to earn that. Again, as I close, I serve him because I have his approval. I want to please him because he has accepted me. I want to please him because his grace is enough. Father, in Jesus' name, I praise you. I thank you for these guys. Lord, I miss my dad. <laughs> but I also understand that he is with you. He is rejoicing in your presence. Lord, I pray that uh, for each of us who are here, I don't know what kind of relationship anybody here has had with their dad. But I pray that if they feel, if they've had a bad relationship, if they've had a toxic relationship, and they've always felt towards you the same way, that they, they just can't seem to do enough, they can't seem to be good enough, they can't seem to try hard enough, that you would convict them today that you are enough for them. That you would convict them today that they need to serve you joyfully from their heart because you have accepted them, not in the hopes that you will. I pray that we would repent of thinking of you, if that's been the case with us, in terms of performance. God, the joy in our life comes from joyfully seeking you and serving you because we know where we stand with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. You know what I love? I love it when that little grandkid runs up and just throws his arms around my leg and says, Hi, Grandpa. He doesn't worry about whether or not he's accepted. He knows he's accepted. Sticky hands and oh, everything and all, you know. And it's good. You pick him up and you just love him. That's how I want to be with my God. Thank you. Turn on one thing. Sing God who never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting same god who's never late he's working all things out
working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will seek for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days. Yes, I will. not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. Same God who never laid, working all things out. He's working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. When my heart is heavy for all my days Oh yes I will For all my days Oh yes I will Refuse to praise To glorify, glorify The name of all names Nothing can stand again And I choose to praise Glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand again. And I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand again. And I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy in my heart is heavy for all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Oh yes. Thank you, Tony. And one of the things I love, no matter how much I screw up my life, the Lord still loves me. Even when I put up a ladder upside down, <laughs> which I did earlier. You, you know, I, I watched Mike, Pastor Mike bring up a light. And earlier today, he saw my finger was bleeding and he reached into his wallet and pulled out a Band-Aid. That's the kind of heart this man has. And, and if, if he can help and reach out in the physical realm, think how much more in the spiritual realm because he loves the Lord. And that's what I love about the pastors here and many of the men that I've met through the years. Some of you first-timers I haven't met, but I pray that you develop a deeper relationship with Jesus this weekend. You know, it's uh, I just love listening to the teaching and I... I, uh, listening to Tony this evening, I'm going, why didn't I think of that? Or, you know, <laughs> it's, I, I, I steal from the best. Anyway, uh, Jim and Norm and maybe Jerry, if you could go over and help uh, serve some desserts. There's cookies, there's cake, there's all kinds of stuff. Have a good evening, guys. <laughs>